Hello, my name is Lucy Siegel and um, I am your host for this session. Thank you for spending your lunch time with us. I'm sure there are many things that you could be doing. Um, this session is brought to you by RTS and it's called Sustainable TV Myth or Reality. Well, I very much hope it's a reality because I'm a, <laughs> an environmental journalist and um, I have been working on communications about climate and nature for a long time. Um, as have um, our illustrious panellists who've got a wealth of experience to share with you. Um, so if it still feels like a myth, um, hopefully we can spend the next hour making it feel like a reality that's definitely going to happen. Um, I'll introduce you to our panellists in a second. Um, as always, we really would love some questions. So um, you'll kind of get a feel for what everyone's specific area is but we've got some really, really good knowledge about how to make this happen here today. So don't be shy. I'll keep checking the question box so you can put in some questions whenever you feel like it. Um, so let me introduce the panelists. Um, we um, are gonna start with Richard. Richard Watson, Director of Commissioning for UK TV. Just give us a wave so we know who you are. Yes, I'm sure your name comes up as well. Um, so as Director of Commissioning, Richard oversees all aspects of UK TV originations. He's led the commissioning team since 2014. During that time, they have delivered a more than six-fold increase in the number of shows they commission. And they're responsible for standout entertainment hits such as Dynamo, Magician Impossible, uh, Taskmaster, BAFTA and Emmy nominated, um, Judge Romesh, um, Emma Willis delivering babies inside the ambulance and the landmark specialist factual series Expedition with Steve Backshall that we were just talking about. Um, you're very welcome Richard, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. We shall have a chat with you in a second. Um, let's move on to Jane, Jane Atkinson who is uh, Senior Vice President Global Production for Fremantle Unscripted in brackets here. Hope you're going to be unscripted today. Very good. Um, Jane works with shows and well, global platforms, Netflix, Amazon, YouTube, Disney Plus, etc. Yes, we have heard of those. Um, now, in 2019, Jane introduced Rosa, who you're going to meet next to the group. And this is really, really significant because today we are talking, obviously, about um, Albert, which you'll learn more about in a minute. Um, so by introducing Rosa, Jane introduced Albert across all territories funded by Fremantle and a first across the business. So all Fremantle companies will now be calculating and reporting their footprints, reducing and aiming for certification in the coming years. And of course, Fremantle is home of entertainment like Got Talent, Family Fortunes, X Factor, and the Netflix smash hit Too Hot to Handle. Well, ah, we should have called this session Too Hot to Handle or something like that to do with global heating. Anyway, that's just occurred to me. Too late, too late. Jane, you're very welcome. Um, Rosa, I've queued you there. I've given you such a big build up. Uh, Rosa Canela Mass is Industry Sustainability Manager for BAFTA. She started her media career 15 years ago, working in production and direction internationally across all different genres, drama, comedy, factual entertainment. And then I find this so admirable because once you've started, it's so hard to do this. But she went on to complete a BSc in sustainability and environmental management, which is just absolutely amazing. You, you're probably one of the most expert people I've ever spoken to about this subject. Um, so obviously very well placed to advise media productions on how to calculate and reduce environmental impact and decarbonizing all that kind of stuff she joined albert five years ago um, we'll hear more in a second and she manages all albert's international relationships and has built the newest version of the albert toolkit carbon calculator and carbon action plans um, welcome Rosa, we'll hear more from you in a second, we're going to get a little intro from you so we all know what we're talking about. Um, and Phil, Phil Holgate, give us a wave, thank Hello. you. <laughs> Head of Production Sustainability at ITV Studios. Um, his work includes leading the delivery of ITV's global sustainable production strategy, focusing on reducing carbon emissions and waste to net zero by 2030 and creating a sustainable culture 
within production teams. That phrase is really important. Um, he has spent many of his 24 years at ITV. Phil, you don't look old enough to have spent 24 years at ITV. Thank you, working Leslie. in scripted production <laughs> and he's um, held several roles in production finance project management uh, before being appointed to a new role focusing on sustainable productions. He represents ITV Studios at BAFTA's Albert Consortium, is part of the European Broadcast Union Sustainability Group and is co-founder of Sustainable Arts in Leeds, wearesale.org. Okay, what an amazing panel. Right, we're going to go straight to Rosa, who's going to give us like a little, uh, like a vitamin pill of what we need to know. Take it away. Uh, hello, everybody. Yes, I'm just going to, I've got three slides, just a little bit to set the scene before you, we start discussing on where we are now uh, in terms of the planet. It's really quick, don't worry, and, and where we are as, a, as an industry. Uh, so the first slide is the magic number, 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. It's a shame because normally I would ask people to answer this for me, but because it's a webinar, I'll have to answer it myself. Uh, so basically 1.5 degrees is the temperature that the, the scientist community, the scientists have said to us that we can't pass. Yeah, let me explain it a little bit further. So the scientists, they collected the, the average surface temperature from the earth before the industrial revolution. So we call it pre-industrial levels. So from that temperature, they say from pre-industrial levels, they think that we cannot pass plus 1.5 degrees. So we cannot increase it by 1.5 degrees. They used to say two degrees, but now they brought it down uh, to 1.5. Um, just to let you know, at the moment, we passed uh, the temperature from pre-industrial levels at around plus one degree. So we are 0 0.5 degrees um, away from, from where we shouldn't get. And today I just read an article that uh, some scientists are saying that there is a 20% chance that global temperatures will reach 1.5 in at least one year in between 2020 and 2024. So that's why the matter of urgency. Um, on the next slide, uh, Jamie, if we can change the slide. Um, I just put the sentence that for me, basically, I think that sentence has changed my life and it's the sentence that I use always with the, with the community, with the media community. Uh, it's taken from the IPCC report from 2018 when they changed from two degrees to 1.5, uh, the no goal, let's say. Uh, and they say IPCC is a group, uh, the group, a community of scientists around the world that they that they um, advise the UN, the United Nations, on adaptation and mitigation of climate change. So they're saying that keeping to the preferred target of 1.5 above pre-industrial levels will mean rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. And I put it in in bold because what that means in terms of our industry, for example, is that re reusable water bottles are really good, are amazing, is a really good way to start. But we really need to look at the way how we operate as a business uh, in order to be more resilient in the future. And we need to change every aspect of our, of our business in, term, in terms to adapt. Um, and the next slide is just to show you, so thanks to our tools, our uh, carbon calculator that many people uh, is, is familiar with, and um, so we collect data from different productions and on our latest annual report, uh, we publish, so what we do is we collect, we create an average number, an average uh, CO2 per hour of output uh, impact of a production uh, within all the productions that we measure. So last year, our latest report, uh, it showed us that producing one hour of TV in the UK it accounts around 9.2 uh, tons of CO2 just for one hour of TV. So if you guys, if the people that is working on film on TV can count on, on, on how, many, how many hours you make, you realize it's much more. And that accounts by around two households uh, in the UK for the full year round uh, running on, on electricity and gas. I have to say, just before I finish this, that this is across every genre. If you look into detail, you'll see that, for example, drama has a carbon footprint of around 38, 35, 38 
tons of CO2 per hour of output. If you go into international factual, it's going to go much more up. And it obviously depends on your production method and, and genre. But if you want to find, find out more, uh, I'll put the website on the chat and you can have a look at the, at the annual report as well for more data. Great, thank you, Rosa. You're very good at this. Very good at uh, putting a lot of information into three slides. Um, am I right in thinking that the reports that you do and you also look at um, how many times things like climate change are mentioned on network TV and that kind of stuff? I remember yeah. a report from a couple of years ago where I think the phrase climate change was used less than ghosts and and zombies and rhubarb zombies. And yeah yeah, yeah. Has, is, is that have you got any updated information for me oh is it is, are we speaking about climate change climate crisis climate emergency more often yeah so we front twice uh, to um to to report at the moment until now and on the second year it definitely went up i think it went up by around 2000 i'll check it once the other ones are discussing because i don't remember the numbers exactly and we are running it again uh, now but still still is much 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 lower than than cats for example we try to compare it to words that they kind of like really normal words. So we definitely mention less climate change than cats, cakes, weddings. Uh, and yeah, and that's another type of report. So we do a report more on the production operations, on the impact of you producing a program. And then we do another report on how much uh, we speak about climate change and how we are educating our audiences about it as well. Amazing. Okay, building on what you've just told us about, I'd like to open up to the panel and, and hear about where they think we're at. So anything that they've done, um, ha have they made any inroads in decarbonizing? Also, you know, we love to hear about failures and things that went spectacularly wrong, not just, you know, for prurience, but maybe we can help, we can crowdsource answers. Um, Jane, let's start with you. Where do you think we're at? And um, you obviously brought Rosa in. Do you regret that decision? <laughs> no, no, I mean, not at all. Not at all. I, I mean, people have heard me tell this story. Rosa came to a conference we were running for the heads of production for 18 countries around the world. And it was sec day two of two days after lunch. I mean, I really slotted her in at the, the death slot. And I'd never seen a group of people really lean in and listen. I mean, all credit to Rosé, you know, her energy and the way she can talk about her business is absolutely spot on. And I think that's why. But what then came of that was both a business need and a, a, a sort of, you know, an, um, a moral requirement to introduce the calculator to the wild world. And what, what's happened is I, I've spent, you know, a long time, too long in production and 10 years, certainly the last 10 years while Albert's been in existence at the BBC. So I'm well aware of what it's been able to achieve in that time frame. We are quite fast tracking it around the world now because again, as you've said, Lucy, it, it is a crisis. And so we don't have the luxury of 10 years with the rest of the world. So we're hitting it hard and they're going in straight away with kind of targets really. And I don't think we really had targets in the early days of Albert when it was first released. But just as a, a small win, what we discovered was what, we, what we've sort of launched on the rest of the world is, you know, to kind of maybe not a lunchtime conversation, but you know, you've got a problem with drink, you've got to admit it to yourself. So by you've got to admit where your problems are and the only way you can do it is to calculate it. So previously we found that a lot of companies actually had really good intentions and were doing really positive things, but it's how do you track it and calculate it? And just an example of one of the good things that we heard at the conference when Rosé was there was that Italy, X Factor, traditionally make their audition shows in a, a huge circus tent, a big canopy. But they had noticed that the, um, there was a building company in, Italy, in, in Rome who had been requested by the government to reduce its emissions. And what it had done as part of that was put an um, advertising billboard, isn't the right word, because it's fabric, on the exterior of the buildings while they were constructing and it absorbed pollution from the cars and so X Factor approached the company and asked if they could make the tent out of the same materials so it's, it's even things that we hadn't even we would never even thought about that ever in our in the way we're working it was just a cultural thing that they they happened upon 
and that predates them getting Albert. So, you know, everybody's in a position really now to be excited about it and to start calculating. What's the hardest bit that you've come across? It, for me and for the global platform, it's where people's starting points are. You know, we have a broad range of companies in different countries and some, the Scandies are very far ahead and they all have access to renewable energy, which as Rosé would say is, is your number one starting point if you can. So they all have access to that. We have countries that will not have access to that for a long time and we'll have to build and spend the time creating that almost procurement process of bringing people into the industry and along the journey with us as well. So that's, that's really, it's the, it's the differences across the world that we're starting with. I know what you mean. I, um, I visited a Swedish vodka company a couple of years ago, <laughs> as you do, with a very low carbon footprint. And I remember they were showing me around their logistics. So I saw the distillation stuff and I was like, yeah, fair enough. I see how you save energy, blah, blah. And then where the trucks came in delivering wheat or a barley, whatever is used in vodka, they had a, a, a checklist and it wasn't just, are you using biofuel or is this an EV? It was like 14 different types of, bio, of biofuel, all with different carbon emission, all with different impacts. I mean, it was- I mean, that's amazing. That's something- Never really dream of. Yeah. So how do you do how do you do that then? Do you try and even everything out or do you have to have loads of different um, targets? We, we are actually evening it out at the moment. The interesting thing is that Rosé can show those slides about the UK footprint. There's nobody taking a footprint around the world in the production industry. There's very few. Germany have a calculator that they use and our team out there use it. So it's hard to start with a baseline that would be consistent. But we, we know that we will spend more time with countries that have got a harder journey to take. Um, but until it, it rolled out in January, so until they start measuring and tell us what their areas of risk are, we don't know where we can focus our attention so much. But we've got a good idea. I think Rosie has been working closely with some of them. So it is, it, it's, it, it's both societal and government and the business of production. It's everything combined. Okay, brilliant. And we'll come back to that idea of where the responsibility lies and who can do what. But thank you very much for that brilliant introduction. Um, Richard, let's come to you. Where are you at? What have you done? Somebody to give me a failure or, you know, a terrible example. I don't know if I can give you a failure. I mean, I can point to some things that we, we need to do more and better, I'm sure. Uh, but let me I'll I'll take start, it. I'll start and see where I get to. And then if I haven't, if I haven't called out enough failure, Lucy, you can call me up on something. Um, where have we got to? Well, we've been working with Albert uh, for quite a while. Um, we, since April last year, we've um, mandated certification for all of our shows. Uh, and we also then um, offset any carbon that we can't reduce, basically, any carbon um, usage that we can't reduce. So that's where we are in terms of original production. Uh, alongside that, we've really tried to embrace the, the planet placement initiative, which is what Rosa was talking about. Like this, this idea of, well, sorry, Lucy, you, you mentioned the cats and the cakes and the other items. Uh, it's what you were talking about, that, that initiative to, to try to embed uh, awareness, references, uh, reminders of the issues of climate change in all of our programs, irrespective of genre. And I think when we think of you know, the percentage of of uh, global emissions that the TV industry in the UK makes up. But, but in fact, in fact, the, industry, the TV as an industry globally makes up relative to other industries. It's clear that um, you know, one of the biggest impacts that we can have is, is influence. So where we can influence um, individuals, authorities, uh, countries you know, around the world, that is gonna have a, a, a more significant impact than us uh, doing the important work within our own industry to reduce our own footprint. Right? Um, so those two things do need to go, go hand in hand. And in terms of planet placement, what, what we've committed to, or what I've committed to personally, is to sit down with every producer before every single production, uh, as we do anyway, we, 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 because I think it's vital that we make sure we're on the same page editorially on day one. Um, and as part of that meeting, uh, that editorial meeting before production, we talk through uh, the importance of planet placement and we and we start to kind of seed some some opportunities in there 
And what we've committed to now uh, is to uh, not, not only to then gather the information through post-production paperwork of every single um, planet's placement within all of our programs, whether they're verbal or visual, um, but we've also committed to having a meeting at the end of every production uh, to discuss with the producers how they got on uh, in order to, um, to hold all of our feet to the flames a little bit. Uh, and as I say, that, that works across all genres. Now, you asked for failures. Now, I don't, this is, I'm going to call out something that we need to do better. I think one of the things that's really um, um, hitting home to me is the importance of having those conversations around planet placement, around carbon reduction really early on. They, they cannot happen early enough, effectively. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty much a case, you know, and I, I would say the same about, um, about inclusivity within our shows as well. You know, these two really important issues are something that we need to be discussing with people on, on day one. And I think that's never more clear than in drama and in scripted comedy where, um, where, where scripts are committed to early on. You know, but really before, often before we get in a room and really start kind of working with the material, those scripts have been written. And, and so the opportunity to find clever ways of, of weaving uh, the issues of climate change into, into our stories has to happen right at the very beginning. And that really is around, you know, it's around my team leaning into it harder and harder. It's also around us continuing to raise awareness across the industry, which hopefully, you know, events like this are doing. You sound like you are very um, invested in this. What, what's your personal um, motivation? Well, my personal motivation is 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 one of uh, of individual responsibility, but also of understanding the the power of broadcasters. You know, bro the broadcasters and and program makers more generally. You know, when we think about distributing our content, the British content across the globe, have an enormous opportunity to influence people. I am um, I'm the father of four kids, uh, pretty much all teenagers, and you know, I'm I'm on a daily basis, highly aware of the world that we leave them. Uh, you know, not just my kids, but other kids. Um, and so that's, you know, my, that, that's my personal, uh, my personal mission is to, is to do my little bit and to try to, to help other people do their little bit because ultimately none of us are gonna do, you know, none of us are Greta. None of us are gonna do so much probably that we, that we change the world, but actually collaboration and working together will, will achieve some change, some significant change. Okay, I'm also really interested in what you're saying about scripts and drama. So I co-host a podcast. Honestly, there's a point to this. I'm not just egregiously plugging my, my work. I co-host a podcast called So Hot Right Now, and we just look at communications on climate and nature in media. And most of the time we're saying, why isn't there more, basically? But we interviewed Lisa Holdsworth, who's a great um, dramatic writer, script writer. I think she's head of the, um, the, the UK Writers Guild as well at the moment and she was saying how hard it has been historically to get this stuff commissioned and she lives in Heb Hebden Bridge um, and she was saying you know there's lots of dramas about Hebden Bridge but no the only time I've been to Hebden Bridge actually is um, to cover it for the one show because it floods every year now practically so a one in a hundred um, you know year event has now become almost like an annual catastrophe and yeah, like why is there no, why is there no um, coverage of that in dramas in, in set in Hebden Bridge? Do you think it's getting better? Do you think it's a less hostile landscape for uh, writers um, who actually want to put the climate emergency into their script? Uh, I think so, yeah. But I mean, funnily enough, we have a show shot in Hebden Bridge, which is, uh, which is actually a, a scripted comedy called Meet the Richardsons, and I'm desperately trying to think about whether we've made good on the references to Tyrone, you know, the bridge in that show. I wish I had that information to have. I mean, flooding's not very funny, is it? I guess. No, no well, so, no, but then, but but uh, but this, that's the point, right? So, you know, the, the planet placement has to operate across all genres, and and I think you know, I, I think what you're getting at is is writers writing on the nose pieces about climate change. And whether it's whether it's easier for them to do that, um, I think we have to be realistic about about how we put the message out to audiences, and that has to be it has to be frequent. It has to be uh, you know there, there will definitely be shows, and we've we've talked as a group here 
about natural history and about how that as a genre is obviously, you know, well, well positioned to address these issues, right? But, but actually the opportunity is to, is to embed these issues in all manner of different ways, subtly and less subtly in all kinds of shows. So, you know, to, to your question, is it easier? Well, I um, actively encourage our drama and comedy writers to, to, to find ways of, of mentioning and referencing climate change. So it doesn't, you know, are, are we, do we have currently a kind of eco thriller on the books? No, we don't. Uh, you know, would I rule that out in the future? Absolutely not, we might do that. But actually the value here is all of our shows having references, visual references, verbal references, uh, you know, narrative references, something, you know, just us really embedding it in all of our content. And I think that, that for me is the big one. Okay, brilliant. Let's come back to what works a little bit later because that's really fascinating. But um, I suppose Chernobyl was uh, an example of an eco thriller discussed. Uh, was that Albert certified, Rosa? I think they did. Yeah, I think they did the certification. Oh, good. Okay, Phil, let's come to you. Um, like where, where, where are you at? What's your, what's your view of, of where we're at right now? Yeah, I was uh, happily enjoying listening to the other panelists there, Lucy. I forgot it's my turn now, isn't it? But uh, no, I, th I think I think the TV industry in the, uh, in the UK specifically at the minute is is really blessed because we've got Albert. Um, you know, it's been around for well, it's ten years old, I think, this year, um, and it's probably one of the greatest examples I've come across of pan industry collaboration, probably anywhere in the world, really. Um, and we see, you know, com who are usual competitors in the market, laying down their tools, working together uh, in a really holistic way towards a, a shared purpose. I think that's, I would say it's unique, but it, it's certainly one of the best examples I've ever come across. So I feel quite lucky in my role uh, in particular. Uh, and I think that's been really key um, because I think it's, on, it's an ongoing success um, and it's momentum that it's continued to keep up over long period of time has come about a, a period of time where it wasn't always just cool to be green. Uh, it seems to be on a lot of people's agendas these days. Um, and also it was at a time where it maybe wasn't quite the genuine strategic importance that it is to businesses at the minute as well. Um, and, and without that background and history and that regular drumbeat that Albert have managed to keep up, I don't think that uh, ITV in our, in our instance would have been in maybe such a great place to set our really ambitious net zero 2030 targets, for example. Uh, and that's been a really a really genuine spark to ignite industry action. Uh, so I feel quite blessed to have that support around us, to be quite honest. Um, just in terms of you know, what have we found out on our journey, people seem really genuinely keen to be green. You know, they want to do more on this. They understand that there is a problem. They don't necessarily understand the science behind it. Um, we're not all climate scientists. and uh, and I think that's okay. It's just that the recurring themes to be they need guidance and direction. Um, and I think that's where, uh, you know, us as an industry can really come together and collaborate on things like that. In terms of bad stories, I don't, I don't have <laughs> many to be quite honest, which is great. Uh, there's maybe just been a little bit of misinterpretation sometimes. Uh, there was a, a, a really interesting conversation around replacing some diesel cars with these hybrids typical situation where you've maybe got a little bit of uh, greenwashing going on there from the manufacturers and what was deemed a hybrid was actually you know no better than the diesel models they were looking to replace so th there's a little bit of like I say guidance and direction needed around uh, some of the solutions but definitely the appetites there uh, which is great to see you're always pushing against an open door. Um, I was looking for something a bit more tabloidy than your usual stuff. No, I'm joking. I'm jo I've set myself up as a sort of muckraker, which I'm not at all. Um, so I think, you know, what I'm hearing from you is, you know, that you feel like the stars are aligned, if I'm hearing correctly. So there's lots of things that have fallen into place at this juncture right now that we haven't necessarily had before. So there's a strategic importance. There's targets so what i want you to do a couple of things for me if you don't mind phil um firstly i'd like you to explain the net zero 2030 target that you've got a little bit more um uh and just maybe for people who are not quite so well versed you know what outline the ambition of that and could you sort of look at, at the tell us about the main areas 
which you'll be looking at to achieve that. Presumably that's a lot about decarbonizing an energy shift. So let's do that first. Okay, so um, yeah, my, my colleagues in our social purpose team are a far better place than me to, to go through this, but I'll give it a sort of headline level if that's all right, Lucy. So um, we, we're going through a process at the minute of setting science-based targets. So that's aligned with the uh, achieving the 1.5 degree warming that, that Rose eloquently talked about at the start of this, uh, of this session. Um, and that's it's split into, uh, our strategy is split into four different columns. So we've got energy, um, so things like powering our buildings with renewable energy, uh, including our studios, et cetera, uh, and looking at maybe some of those, um, I won't get too sciencey, but the, the emissions that we can directly control. So, um, you know, energy that's on site or uh, burning diesel generators, for example, really targeting some of those things. Uh, secondly, looking at waste. So, uh, you know, a huge amount of emissions come from waste. So, Firstly, how, how do we go a little bit further upstream and eliminate waste in the first place? And then how do we manage it uh, on an ongoing basis? Uh, and that includes things like single use plastics and trying to eliminate those from our operations as well. Um, thirdly, and, and probably most important, well, second most important, I'll say, uh, is sourcing. So a huge, you know, well over 90% of our emissions actually sit in our supply chain. So it's not, you know, kind of outside of our direct control, but very much that indirect control. So there's a huge piece of work underway at the minute. Um, with some great support from our procurement team and actually a, a lot more industry collaboration on that in particular because uh, a lot of producers and broadcasters share the same supply chain. Um, so there's some great examples of collaboration. Can you give me there. some examples of what those are? Uh, it could be all sorts. I mean, the one that, that springs to mind, which is a very sort of live conversation at the minute, is around uh, sports and sport broadcasting. So it's quite a niche field and, and quite a small group of, of suppliers that, that uh, supply that particular genre. Um, so there's lots of conversations between ITV Sports, Sky Sports, BBC, etc., cetera, um, where they're engaging with the suppliers. You know, it's not around, it's not all about uh, beating people with a, a big stick or anything like that. It's, it's proper engagement and figuring out how you can all work together for, uh, you know, that, that common, common purpose. So that's kind of the third pillar. Um, and then fourthly, it's around changing culture. So uh, my sort of stock phrase is, you know, being sustainable and uh, uh, isn't my job, it's everybody's job. So how do we get to that position where everyone on a production and everyone in the business is working towards that common goal as well? And that's inclusive of things like you know, training, one-to-one -one sessions, even anything like this, you know, we've shared this invite with people for today's session, uh, just so people can hear it. and and allowing people really to understand what their piece of the puzzle is uh, and I think you know if you give people that guidance then they, they're genuinely up for it. Do you think that um, uh, I'm just thinking about things like you mentioned sports broadcasting and you know live broadcasting and stuff like that you, you used to have like you know fleets of sat trucks and now you've got, you know, I've been, I, I, I used to do quite a lot of lives and you know more lately I've seen people with their phone and a thing on a stick in a tripod and you know that deep dematerialization and you know how technology is getting smaller is it getting easier to um cut carbon in those sorts of operations because of technology and the tools that we have i think i think potentially i'd be interested to know what what other people on the on the panel think to this as well but yeah i think there are some great instances there's um, a lot of work around cloud-based technology for example so you don't have to take all of the kit and caboodle with you wherever you go um you, you just need access to this cloud-based technology um and you know that that's actually been accelerated by covid uh, because we you know have had to find different more intelligent ways of working just to keep people safe but it was something we were maybe working towards um potentially with a slightly longer roadmap but i think technical innovation has got a huge part to play in it um you know likewise you know what does 5g mean you know do we need great big satellite trucks and if the kit's getting smaller and we're not carrying as much around then you know potentially the vehicles are getting smaller where does electrification and, or, or hydrogen power come into that as well so you could see how eventually we could get there for me my personal frustration is the the pace of it is is too slow you know we need, really need to be picking up the pace um and that's where you know engaging with our supply chains and making people realize that there is demand out there then hopefully supply will, will quickly follow would it be helpful if we declared or this industry declared a climate emergency as others have done um i'd, I'd question if it's 
what what do you hope to achieve from that you know is it effective in doing it and there's not there's no harm in doing it i guess but uh, i think a lot of the conversations we've been having recently and it's something that you sound like you're personally interested in lucy around um climate comms and the thinking around it is the need to remain positive and, and being um not to not to just pretend that nothing is going on around us and fingers in the ears and everything's going to be fine but actually there, there are solutions out there there is a roadmap that we can follow um, and I think that, that great action sometimes comes from optimism, and that's maybe where TV can really play a, a really vital and important part in that unique platform that we've got and our ability to reach out to people. TV optimism, I like it. Okay, <laughs> Rosie, I'm going to come to you, just if you wouldn't yeah. mind, sort of in a nice way, sort of mopping up. Is there anything from there that you wanted to pick up on? Well, um, so many things. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> We've got limited time and I've also got to launch a competition, so go for it. Yeah, no, I just mentioned, for example, in terms of the suppliers that uh, you, you were asking and Phil was mentioning, one thing that from Albert we always say, at least personally I say a lot, is for us as a community, as an industry, to realise that we have much power, obviously, on our audience in terms of the message that we put out there, but also as a consumer, we are consumers. And the same as I teach, like as an individual person, you have much, much power because you consume, you are a consumer. Uh, in terms of the industry, we've seen many changes in the UK, for example, in terms of productions or companies uh, asking just asking a question to a supplier that happened with post-production houses so on our certification we have a question that is is um is your post-production house using renewable energy i mean so the the user the production manager goes to the post-production house and asks that question probably maybe without the interest yeah so then the post-production house when five productions have asked them they contact us and they say what can i do because i don't want i don't want to lose business so again it's about we have much power to ask, and that's something with Fremantle Productions around the world that now we're working, obviously, is what Jane was saying. They are in a completely different uh, place sometimes. There are countries that they have to use um, they have to use generators in a studio because, because the electricity goes suddenly. So it's about, okay, so what can you talk to your suppliers? What can you ask them? Which technology you want to you wanna ask? And, and we do have much, much power to change that. Uh, that's one thing I wanted to mention on the suppliers. Uh, then another thing I wanted to mention as well on, on what Phil mentions about the people wants to do things. That's one thing that with the five years experience I had, the majority of the people when you enter a room, they want to do things. However, they don't even know where to start and they probably don't even understand what's going on don't even understand what's their responsibility and more importantly, don't understand how they can make it better so and that really ring, uh, links with what Richard was saying about content so we spent our lifetime saying that we don't things terribly and horribly but I'm sorry I'm a big tv consumer and everybody here knows if I sit on my sofa I put the tv and I have a program telling me I'm a terrible human being I'm going to change the channel I don't want to know that after all the hours work I've done what I want to know is how I can make it better and this is our responsibility as an industry, teach people how they can make it better. And it doesn't have to be preachy. It can be as Richard said, with props, with actions. And in terms of the comedy, I wanted to say like flooding, comedy, I found it, my brain is, is thinking. But one of the things I'm gonna say, we, I'm not in the UK, I'm from Spain, but I'm from Barcelona. And Catalans, we have a really uh, humor to you. And it's about, come on, we laugh about politics, we laugh about Brexit, we laugh about terrible things that are really destroying our lives sometimes. Why can we not laugh about climate change? You know, I think you know, actually the last, I don't know if it was an RTS debate, but quite recently we did a session with um, young writers and Richard Curtis did it about climate mm -hmm. and nature. And I think I'm right in thinking they could write into any genre, they all pick comedy. They all yeah. found climate climate crisis mm -hmm. hilarious, <laughs> or at least our response. They're laughing to it. because we haven't done anything about it. Like we're laughing at you know at certain politicians that they've been that it's like why do we have this? So probably they're laughing because they can't believe that we have done nothing. Yeah. So from that outrage, I suppose is that is mm -hmm. that you know. Mm -hmm. 
comedy. Okay, mm. that's brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, we've got a lot of questions coming in as well. So I, I, um, I'm going to take some of those in a minute. Um, I just wanted to um, just uh, field a few more questions out um, whilst I've got you here. So Jane, I'm so fascinated by the international aspect of what you're doing. And then hearing Rosé talk about it, it makes me think about all of this in such a different perspective. What do you need to go further and faster? It, and I suppose the same question that I asked Phil, you're working in some countries that are on the front line of climate and are experiencing it. Are you sort of, does that affect the way that you think about it, the way that they respond? And this, I suppose the same climate emergency question, do you think it would be helpful if we declare the climate emergency as an industry or not? For me first, yes. I think we, I mean, from a, from the first part of your question, Lucy, what we need is we need wider collaboration. So we need other production companies to come on board in the territories that we're in because we can't operate in isolation, but we will until they come. Um, it Governance as well. You know, we've now seen a change of um, leadership, shall we say, in the US, which will help the cause out there for us as well. So that's another position in, in and that's relevant I take the US as an example. We have other territories that might have similar issues as well. Uh, broadcasters, that's really what we need engagement with on that level as well. We do have a couple of international broadcasters, which Rosé can speak about, who are in alignment with Albert. And, you know, Albert's a fantastic resource. We're not saying it's the be all and end all, but what it does is it brings together a community of people who are able to speak the same language and, and, uh, and look at the same risks. Um, and in terms of the cli climate emergency, I mean, to echo Phil's words, you know, personally, I agree, we are in it. That's where we are. And it's a, it, it is an, an issue that needs to be spoken about in those terms. But is it, you know, like I, we make entertainment TV. What we are trying to do is we've got an, um, you know, an engaged global audience. How do we normalize the conversation in our content rather than necessarily being having the programs that we can go out and state how we make those changes how do we normalize it how do we make it I mean a very obscure you know we make grand designs so we see a lot of it in grand designs but how do you take people away from thinking that you know gas or a, um, a fossil fuel energy is a normal process and what alternatives are there and we have a wide scope of genres that can do that it's just getting that into the conversation okay thank you very much Richard do you think we should declare a climate emergency? What do we need to push forward? Um, I, so in terms of a climate emergency, look, I think, I think, I think others have already uh, said it articulately, which is that you know, we, we need to reach different people, right? So some people have already heard the message. Now there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, news around there about the climate emergency. Ultimately, you know, I, think, I think in many ways, a lot of sectors of society have already declared it and are certainly already aware of it. But at the same time, there are clearly plenty of people within the UK who aren't that aware of it or aren't that engaged with it is maybe a, a, a better way of saying it. And I think that's why it isn't just about shouting really loudly. You know, I think, the, I think you know, Phil was talking about the kind of positivity of it. And I think you're right. I think if you shout really loudly in someone's face, sometimes they don't want to listen. And so if we think about the fact that we've already reached a bunch of people, we've already reached probably the people who are more likely to be engaged first, but actually it's the periphery. It's the people who, who least want to engage with it that we want to reach. We've got to be more imaginative in how we get that messaging across, I think. And I think that's really where the power of planet placement comes. So, uh, you know, I, I think, I th again, I think Phil said it, it's, it's a, effectively a kind of possibly a neutral thing. I don't think it'd be a bad thing if we declared a climate emergency. Maybe it would actually put a few people off. I don't know, but I think there are other there are there are other more nuanced ways of taking that conversation forward now. I think. Um, I mean, oh, sorry. Carry on. No, go on. I was going. Well, I was going to talk about what what I what I need. <laughs> but no, on, please. Can, that's the point. You tell me what you need. Um, I I tell you what I um has been really relevant for for me, and this um again actually is is allied to inclusivity as well as sustainability right? and and that is analyzing where we are at not as a company you know we as a, as a company and as the bbc we have a commitment to to reach uh, net zero carbon by 2030 and that is there's, there's a lot of work from a lot of other people uh, you know going into achieving that and and phil's right the, the supply chains are really complicated um but um um 
Oh, oh, apologies, I've completely forgotten what it's going to say. Oh, but, but what I um, what is really difficult for us is balancing where, where, where it's our origination. So we can work with Albert or we can work with Project Diamond to understand the makeup of our own shows. But what is really problematic is when we acquire content from other people. And what I would love to see uh, is, a, is a kind of DNA card, a kind of set of carbon credentials for a programme that travel with that programme. Now, we see it to a degree in the, in the end card. We've got our Albert certification logo up there. But I'd like a much more detailed passing of information that is linked to that programme wherever it goes. And there will be some people around the world who don't want to listen, right? They don't care. But, you know, to Rosa's point, you you um, are, are just asking the question or just making people aware of, of, the, of the needs to track these things will eventually have an effect. So in order for us to understand our own content better, um, I would love it. In order for us to spread the, the awareness more globally, I would love to have that kind of DNA card that, that we, you know, and that, that, relies on, that relies on producers and broadcasters being prepared to share that information. And also, you know, for the UK to lead in that respect, which I think there's no reason why we shouldn't do. Okay, brilliant. Um, I'm going to start taking some questions because there's some really good ones here. I'm going to stay with you, Richard. Caitlin McGiven asks, how much are you seeing these sustainability goals reflected formally, i.e. in contracts? I'm a film and TV lawyer and find there is a bit of a disconnect between the stated enthusiasm to tackle this issue and actually including written obligations and agreements. That's an interesting point, isn't it? Yeah, so we, uh, where it sits, I believe, in our organisations within our um, editorial specification. So, you know, we, we call out um, a requirement. It's not a, a people are not going to be in breach of contract currently if they if they don't do that. But ultimately, you know, we work collaboratively with producers and generally producers want, want to work collaboratively with us and they want to, you know, they want to they please the broadcaster. And they want to say, well, if it's important to us and if we make them aware of the fact it's important to us, um, and of course, as individuals, it's often important to them too. They they will work with us. So it's it's not a it's not a contractual obligation, but as I say, we we now have a meeting at the end of every production, at which you know very specifically we get a, we get a list as part of the post production paperwork that talks of you know they will, they will show we'll see their carbon footprint, we'll see all the the mentions of um, of climate change and sustainability within the shows, and at that point, I'm going to be sitting opposite, hopefully actually physically opposite them at a table saying what happened what have you done could you have done better what should we do next time um you know so that that's that's our that's my influence i hope in in trying to achieve that rather than the contractual contractual one yeah i want to add something on this so in terms of all the main broadcasters in in the uk uh, have made the the carbon footprint so the carbon footprint of the production part of the deliverables so you need to show your carbon footprint when you deliver the program uh, which i think that's kind of a, an advance and some of them are doing certification and plan placement and things like that but the calculator is for everybody and another thing an example that we have from albert is we created a, a document called green rider like a campaign uh, that he and we sent to different like cast agencies and so in terms of showing cast actors and actresses that they can actually ask something in the contract you know if they would ask okay I want to fly from here to there or I want to take so that they can ask on the contract I don't want to fly to go home I, I want you to buy me a train ticket and things like that. So that's something that obviously from Arbor we can't do because we don't contract anything <laughs> or we don't hire anything, but, but we always trying to push this within our consortium members. Sorry, I'll just unmute myself. Rookie mistake there. You'd think after a whole year of doing this that I'm yeah. <laughs> actually getting worse at Zoom, by the way. Um, <laughs> Uh, let me, there's so many interesting questions, I'm getting really sucked up in reading them all. So do you, panellists, do just shout if you want to um, uh, come in off the back of this, like, like Rosé did. Um, just one for you, Rosé, just off the back of what you said. Can you encourage production company execs to do Albert training too? Very hard to prioritise environmental decisions in production if there isn't loud support from all execs. Do you have much traction with execs? I mean, we've obviously got some goodies today, but generally... Yeah, we do. So basically, obviously, we um, we offer the trainings, 
And it depends on the program and the company. So what we're trying to do, for example, with Fremantle now that they came in internationally, it has helped a lot. So because what we found is that productions wanted to do things, but normally it would be, I'm generalizing, eh? it would be the production manager, you know, like, like someone in the production team, but not super senior, uh, that wants to, that wants to, um, to do the carbon footprint or to do the certification, for example, yes? Uh, but then it's quite hard to get the execs on board sometimes. But however, when your company, for example, Fremantle, because it's not now a UK thing, it's an international thing that has really, really helped for CEOs on every company that they have in each country, and even for the CEO of Fremantle to get involved and to push that down. And then when you push from, from, from top to bottom is when they're gonna have the time, like all the freelancers, all the PMs are gonna really have the time to attend these trainings. But I, I do understand, I do understand that frustration sometimes that as a, as a senior production team, you wanna do something, but maybe. And I think, sorry, Lucy, to interrupt. Yeah, please. It has, it has to be because it is a cultural change that's throughout the whole program. And I think personally, it was my 10 years at the BBC that made me think this has to start with the MDs and that's where we, we've landed it because they have to create that culture with their, with their teams who then anyone can fill in the form, that's fine, preferably somebody more senior, but it, it has to be. And, and I appreciate that's been quite hard in the UK market for some companies. Okay, while I have you, Jane, do you think we could see more shows about the environment in prime time? That's from Nicholas. I, I saw that and I think, I mean, absolutely. I think there's nothing stopping us put those, putting those programmes in prime time, but I, I echo Rosé's words about how they are presented and how they are pitched and that we have a limit, and especially during the last year where we've all gone through enough as to what we can tolerate in terms of, I mean, it's very difficult to identify prime time now. I think, let's be honest about that. You know, we have TV 24 hours a day and it's accessible to everybody and you know it's it's in a different position now but we can certainly have it but it's how it's how it's put out there and let's reference back to the comedy and the floods i mean i suppose if i'm thinking about plastic and um we got we seem to get a lot of um focus on plastic in so-called prime time although i do take your point that it's difficult to say when that is now um but that was an issue that seemed to i suppose break through yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've sort of watched some of the comments and I really appreciate people who say, who's telling us what we can do better? And I, I understand that. I think probably when we've been talking so long as a group and we know it because it's, in our, it's now in our DNA, somebody also commented, and I'm not stealing your question, sorry, Lucy. No, go for it. There's so many I think it's connected where they said, do you need an, you know, a bit like we have COVID supervisors on sets now. Do we need an environmental advisor on a set? And of course it can be beneficial. And I would suggest probably in a big movie or a big scripted, it really has. But ultimately, like all things that we're trying to achieve, whether it's uh, sustainability or diversity, you need that DNA in the people who are working in the business to take it on and to understand it. So I think that I find that a fair comment of saying, who's telling us what we can do better? Because we've got obsessed with plastic. We need to have to move on from plastic, need wholehearted change and bigger change. And, and I'm not sure, I don't know, Phil, Richard, if you've got a comment on how we, how we get that across. Yeah, I think, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head for me, Jane. There's, there just seems to be massive lack of global lead, a leader, some proper good old fashioned leadership. And, you know, going back to my previous points, people just want to be shown the way, I think, a lot of the time. And, and if we look at, you know, who are probably the two people that spring to mind, you've got a, a 90 odd year old broadcaster in Sir David Attenborough, who's amazing. And, and the other one's a teenage activist. And that, they're, they're our leaders. You know, that's not right. Who's actually leading the way? And it's a huge frustration. Well, uh, who do you think a leader would be then? Who, who, who would be a good leader? Uh, I think yourself, Lucy, would be really good. Person. I think so too. May I just flag that <laughs> I, I I've don't got know. dispatches I'll... on the eighth of March coming up on an environmental <laughs> theme. <laughs> well, you start with your podcast and get bigger. Yeah, uh, I think I think uh, I don't know the answer to that. I, and if if we knew that, then you know they'd already be in that leadership position. It might not be one person. It, it it just seems like there's a real lack of it. Generally speaking, I don't know what the reasons are behind it either. Um, but I think it's it's there. Richard. Oh, sorry, Rosie. 
It seems a little bit what, what you said about that. I didn't answer that question about the climate emergency. So, for example, in terms of the industry in the UK, to be honest, I don't even think it's necessary because we have been working for 10 years. So, Albert exists for 10 years, it's our 10th anniversary, and we have gone super far. Like, on the, I started five years ago, and it, we've gone so, so far. Not us, those companies that, that, that Jane, Richard, and, and Phil are representing here, like, really, like, they are really, really looking into the, you know, into the brains and everything of their company to try to do it. And we have Albert that it helps them collaborate with each other. So if Phil finds something that it can be useful to another company, he's gonna share that. So I think that's more valuable than an industry shouting, which obviously it's got the calm and the noise, but, but an industry shouting, okay, we declare climate emergency. And what are you doing? Because we've heard, like, and I've heard that on the industry, you'll be surprised on how many meetings I have with people. We wanna do this, we wanna do that. And they've been saying that for five years. Mm -hmm. I think climate emergency is more the message to the public, but I think I think the reason the reason why I'm very interested in it is because I've seen it happen in other sectors, and I think yeah. it does cause a shift. And I think that one of the things that it does, I take everyone's point about voluntary action, and you know, you've got a you've got a very nuanced responsibility, haven't you? Because you know, as Richard. Um, articulated really well I thought you have to get to an audience who are not already engaged and they might be scared witless by um, phrase climate emergency or they might be alienated because they think it's ridiculous so there's a whole kind of Pandora's box there potentially but we also have as Jane was talking about you know we have these examples you've now uh, had to bring in COVID supervisors on sets we have you know, um, people who now I understand, I don't really work on those sort of shows, but but supervise sex scenes to make sure that everyone yeah. is comfortable. These are things that would have been unheard of. These are things that if you pop out and in isolation, make them into a sort of headline may look ridiculous, but they are all a means and a process. And doesn't declaring something and saying, we're taking this really seriously, this is the utmost threat right now for all of us, doesn't that give it a framework from which all of this becomes possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you're probably right on this. It's just for, for me, like Albert, he's been the climate emergency group uh, from, from a long time ago. But I understand it's because we are so sort of drawn into the project as well. But you're right, you're right, the fact of shouting about it makes people react react much faster but that always needs to be to get that needs to come together with the framework and guidance and what to do and how to do it because I think that's what many industries are missing and the, the important the collaboration the collaborating with your competitors in terms of sustainability because at the end of the day we all want to survive as a business and that's what we're trying to do here we're just trying you know for all these companies to survive and to carry on making content in a few years time. Okay, and, and, and that question was really prompted by um, Evangeline, who'd said, um, uh, shouldn't each production have an environmental officer? Um, in terms, I want to I wanna, I wanna mention, because in terms of Albert, what we always try is to, for productions to understand that that's something that they need to own as a production, and each member of the crew needs to own, because at the beginning, it used to be more a production a production department thing. So obviously, you can't change what the costume department does from your production department. Like, they know what they're doing. So that's why we always try to go away from the conversation of how we, having a, a green runner or sustainability coordinator. There are thousands of names for it. Obviously, if you have a massive show, probably you'll need that. But we don't want people to says on this because then if you are a small show you're going to be thinking oh I can't be sustainable because I can't hire someone extra and and it's owned by the production by the whole production so if you get a green steward make it part of the production team like from day one and is a one crew member uh, like maybe maybe um maybe reporters and presenters could also appoint themselves as uh environmental stewards just to make ourselves even more popular listen i'm really sorry we're out of time and i think that's because i massively mismanaged the questions and kept talking myself which i'm afraid i do do um we've got we're going to harvest these questions many of them um uh 
may be useful to you actually rose and there's lots of um lots of um conversations starting on here as well and i know some of you have looked through so thank you so much but we we will we will get your questions and we will you know respond in some way um but thank you very much for joining us at the start i said um which we probably haven't answered um what was it green sustainable tv myth or reality no i mean we've definitely proved it's a reality right <laughs> um i also suggested another title that um jane gave me inspiration for and but the winner of that um, unofficial uh, competition is Ganesh, who said that this session should have been called Chancing on Ice. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. You win, Ganesh. There's no prize, but you win. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to um, all of our panellists for joining us today, to Richard, Jane, uh, Rosé, Phil, and most of all, thank you to all of you for coming along. Please can we stay in touch? If you're not um, engaged with Albert, um, you know where to find them. So um, with great reluctance, um, I am declaring this session ended, but thank you. And let's talk more next time because there's a lot to do. Thank you.